Hey, everybody. It's one o'clock. I am going to go live here in just a second. I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to get connected. I hope that my stream is stable today. Um, if you're living in the South like we are, it has been a very chaotic. <laughs> uh, well, it was in December and some of the weather did seem to affect our Internet. So um, give me just a minute to get everything set up here and we'll get started. And if you are already on with me, if you would, in the comments, um, please leave. Uh, let me know that you're here, where you're from, and what your favorite machine is. Um, we're talking about vintage machines today, obviously. Um, some of you are brand new to vintage machines. Some of you are um, looking to add to your collection. So we're going to address both of those today. And what else? Let me see if we got everything going here. All right. And I don't know that I'm actually going to be able to see um, your comments. This is a new streaming system we have. This is our very first um, weekly live that we're doing. I am trying to do one every single month with a different theme. So that's kind of our plan. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully people will jump in here. I know we've got people on Facebook, we got people on YouTube. So I see people from all over the place here. So wonderful. All right, well, for all of you that are new to um, Sewing Doc Academy, I'm Andy Barney. I wanna give you a very brief um, introduction because I wanna get, we got a lot of good stuff to get into. Um, I have been servicing, restoring and repairing sewing machines for going on 12 years now. Um, I started exactly where most of you are, which is just with an interest in vintage machines. Um, and it kind of grew into this was not planned. This was not my career path at all. Um, but at this point, I can't imagine doing anything differently. I do own my own service shop. We've been a, a business for almost 10 years now. I started in my home with restoration. I do work on all machines, vintage, modern, and everything in between. I am factory trained by Brother Janome and Viking, but our shop is known for um, for vintage machines. So we get, we're at the point now, post-COVID, um, you know, that really left the, the, older generation that were working on these machines that had the knowledge has pretty much retired at this point. Everybody's burned out from the last two years. So, um, so part of why I do this is because if we don't, there's no way to learn. So nobody's doing what we're doing. This is, this is something new for the world. So um, we're trying to give new life to people, to having knowledge on machines. So that means that if you are new to machines, we want to empower you to know how to use your machine, how to take care of your machine. And then there's another part of that where there are several people looking at retirement income, side income. There is such a need for what we do. So that's that's why we do what we do. Um, our shop is located in Cumming, Georgia, which is the northern suburbs of Atlanta. And we are to the point where we get probably five or six emails a day from people all over the country wanting to ship their machine to us so we can restore it, repair it, because you can't usually take your old 1902 Singer machine into your service shop that is a dealer and say, can you fix it? Because a lot of times they don't have anyone on staff that knows. So that's a lot of the basis of what we're doing. As far as our series, we're focusing on vintage machines um, and purchasing and uh, things of that nature this month. And if you stick with me, we will have the download for the guidebook. Again, this is, um, this is stuff that we are publishing and it's also part of our paid vintage machine workshop for restoration, repair and service. And um, we're going to keep adding to this for the next uh, four weeks, actually. So um, if you're not already in, you're on Facebook. So if you're not already in our Everything Sewing Machines group, I highly recommend it. And I do appreciate it. Part of that is because um, when we do updates to our material or offer new things, we test a lot of things out in there. We ask for opinions. We want your feedback. So you don't have to be um, in, enrolled in one of our workshops to participate, but we really value your feedback as far as what are you looking for? What, what are, um, hurdles are you stumbling upon that you can't get over? So you're helping us to form this free material, our workshops. So I would love to have you if you're not already in there. 
Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started on our material. This week we're working on uh, vintage machines, as I said before. Let me get over here. And um, I put together a slideshow here. I know we're all visual. Um, and a lot of this, I think most of this is actually in the guidebook. So you don't have to take extensive notes. These uh, videos are going to live on our Facebook page forever and on YouTube. So if you're rushed and don't can't take notes, don't worry, you can go back and review it as much as you want. Okay, so we're talking first about where to find machines. And this is kind of an evolving um, process. You know, we we the, a lot of our sources have been around forever, but there's just things that I, I've noticed that people hadn't thought of before. So I'm going to start with where we're at, which is Facebook Marketplace. This has probably been the largest growth I've seen of any market. Um, in fact, I think Craigslist has kind of gone away because Facebook Marketplace has made it safer to connect with people that have the things that you want. So with Facebook Marketplace, if you're, um, you're already on Facebook, so you must have access. If you are on a computer laptop and you've not ever been to Marketplace, you're, it's going to look like this in a little drop down menu on the, on the left side, and you're going to find the word marketplace over there. If you're on your phone, um, everybody's looks a little different because you can kind of customize your um, your screen. It's going to be the same thing. It's the same marketplace. It just may be in a different location. So if you poke around enough, you can find it. And then I think once you use it, it might position itself a little bit more accessibly for you. All right. So we, this is on the desktop view here. Um, when you go in, you're, I did a search here. You look under search results. It says um, old sewing machine. That's just kind of where I start sometimes. Um, you can just put in sewing machine um, or, you know, specific brands. What I really want you to pay attention to is this section here, which is um, your location. So for me, it's coming Georgia and I elected for it to be within 17 miles because if I'm looking for a deal, I kind of don't want to drive. You can change that to be if you're willing to drive three hours for that dream machine, you can look all over the place. Um, and then also on the delivery method, what I really like about Facebook is the local pickup. Um, again, a lot safer than Craigslist. You still have to be very careful. Um, if you've not heard of this, they do. There's a lot of people that do what they call porch pickup. And that means that if, I've done this several times. I've sent Paul out to pick up machines. Um, if you're paying $15, $20 for a machine and it's a low end item that the person's just trying to get out of their home, they'll often say, let's do porch pickup. That means they're going to leave it literally sitting on their porch. They're going to give you their address. And um, you're going to put your money in cash or whatever in an envelope, probably going to get the instructions, to leave it in their mailbox, under the doormat or whatever. But there's no actual face-to-face inter -face interaction. Um, I've done that a number of times. I'm not really sure how popular that is anymore, um, but it's been great. Um, obviously, if you if that's not an option or you're not comfortable, meeting in a public place is your best bet. Um, and that's just the case for all of them. Now, the problem with sewing machines, though, is you get a lot of older folks that are trying to get rid of their sewing machine and they can't lift the sewing machine. It might be in a cabinet. It might be one of those um, beautiful Lady Kenmore's that weighs literally 50 pounds and they're not willing to drive, leave their house and come meet you in public. And I'll say also with meeting in public, there have been so many people that have been burned by having to drive across town and then the people never show up. So you're probably going to get a lot of people that are like, you got to come get it. Um, so it's, it's every individual is different. You can also search the entire Facebook marketplace, um, for people that will ship and we'll talk about shipping at another point, but that is also an option. All right. So with the pricing, this is going to be true for pretty much any, uh, site like this. People really don't know a lot about sewing machines. So you're going to see pictures with the machine backwards and it's going to show you the motor and not the front. So um, you're going to get people that think that just because it's old, it's worth thousands of dollars. It's really a crapshoot with this part. We are going to talk about pricing next week, um, but you're going to most often see ridiculously high prices. I, you, If you follow any of the vintage machine groups on Facebook, you see people posting all the time saying, who in their right mind would ask $2,000 for this rusty old machine? It does happen. And you can't argue with those people either. So also people will put in $1 or like $1,230,000. $1, and those are usually just people that don't have any idea what to expect and just want you to make an offer. So if you see any weird odd pricing like that, it's usually because they don't, they don't know what to ask. And they'll take whatever someone's going to give them in most cases. All right, so for safety, we talked about this before. Again, meet in public place when possible. Take someone with you, especially, I mean, if you're 
going to pick up a heavy machine, you're going to want someone with you anyway. And then I also um, advise paying cash and take only the amount agreed upon. Um, don't do even PayPal. Don't do any credit card services. Um, there are a lot of scams out there. We're going to try to build another component for that, but that is so widespread and ever changing. If you, even if you have pay through PayPal, they can dispute it. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can happen. Um, I just prefer to pay cash and be done with it. All right. So my second source is eBay, which has been around forever. Um, I will say eBay, in my opinion, has improved somewhat in the sewing machine sector. Um, I just did a search here for, again, old sewing machine, and uh, it's going to bring up pages and pages and pages of, of sewing machines. Um, obviously, shipping is a bigger concern, and we'll talk about that in a minute. What I do like is that there seems to be a growing option for, um, for a local search. You can do the same thing that with Facebook now. Um, that you on eBay, which means you can look for a local area and see if there's anyone that you can meet up with as opposed to having a machine shipped. Um, but you can search everywhere for machines that can be shipped. So for eBay, there is a buy now option. And that's the part to me that's been most improved. I feel like you still see a lot of auctions for things on eBay, but more often I'm seeing buy now as opposed to having to wait and do the whole auction thing. So what buy now means is that you can skip an auction and you can just buy it at the price they have listed. You pay at the checkout. This initiates the entire transaction. Um, you probably will have already had some communication with the seller about pickup or what's going to happen to it. And then you also find listings with best offer. So somebody has an asking price on there, but they're willing to entertain you making an offer. Uh, again, that's usually people that don't know uh, anything about sewing machines. So here is a sample. I, again, this is just old sewing machine. If you look at that listing up there at the top, I'm not really sure. It looks like it could be a Singer 99. And ridiculously priced at $500. Um, and I'm not really sure I hadn't clicked on this listing, but uh, what I want to point out is it does say or best offer and free shipping. So, and it also benefits a charity. So and it, with it having 33 watchers, that leads me to believe that they probably have promoted this and whatever charity they're supporting that maybe um, is kind of feeding, like people are willing to pay a little more because it's charity based. Um, but I have no idea. And then I also want you to look down here at the toy machine. Um, that's an example of what an auction looks like. So it's going to tell you how many bids it has, which is one, and how long is left and what the current, I'm not sure, I think that's the current bid right now. Now, as a caveat also, if you're going to get involved in an auction, many times they will do a reserve pricing, which means that even if you win the top bid, let's just say you ended up winning this machine what for what you think is $85. They have a reserve on there that if they didn't get at least 125, they have the right to cancel the auction. So you may still not get your item. Um, I only see auctions anymore, either with a charity um, benefit or if someone has something more rare. You see it a lot with the children's machines because they are higher value. They're collectors, not really have a purpose other than looking cute. Um, but I don't, I only see it with high end, like you're going to see them with featherweights, you're going to see them with featherweight accessories. But for that Singer 99 up there at the top, it would be kind of a waste of energy for people to do an auction. So for auction, um, again, there's usually for more high end and high demand machines, um, they want the highest dollar possible. Again, with an average Singer 99, you're not going to get $500 for that machine. The listings going to show how long is left in the auction. And eBay does have a built-in system that bids for you. I think it's in $1 increments, but you can designate what your limit is. All right. Now, this point is extremely important. Um, you only want to bid on an item when you're in the last several minutes. The, most people, if you're not experienced with eBay, will go on there and go ahead and put in their top dollar that they're willing to pay. And all that's going to do is drive the price up between now and the time the auction ends. So if it's a machine you really want, you want to sit on your computer and keep refreshing that screen. When you get down there, have your limit in there and then hit like when you get down to like the last 30 seconds, that's when you the bidding really happens. So um, anything before that is just driving up the price. There's tons of YouTube videos out there about eBay, by the way, and the best way to, to manage that. So for paying for your items, um, I'm going to say this for just about everything. When you need to pay by card or some type of money system, PayPal is always the way to go. Not Venmo, not um, uh, Zelle, none of those newfangled ones. Um, 
PayPal is really good because eBay and PayPal will both back you in a bad transaction. And that's going to happen sometimes with these. So it's they're made to protect you over the seller. When it comes to shipping machines, which I'll cover a little bit um, later, um, I'm going to suggest that you contact the, the person selling. You kind of want to feel out if they're knowledgeable. You can look at their listing and see if they have, if like if they're selling a bunch of sewing machines, then they probably already have a foundation in knowing how to ship a machine. Um, otherwise, if it's just some guy with a random sewing machine he found in a garage and you see a $15 shipping rate on there, chances are they're going to take it to UPS, throw it in a box, and it's going to end up damaged. So the best thing you can do is message the seller and see if you can get an idea of their shipping capability. Um, so in shipping, um, they have the responsibility to ship it properly. And I will say it's getting better because if they don't ship it properly and it arrives damaged, then you have recourse of action that you can take with eBay. Um, like I said, most of them are not going to know how to ship one unless they've dealt with sewing machines before. If your machine does arrive damaged, you take pictures and you submit a claim. And eBay is going to go to that person and say, you've got to make this right. Now, eBay will sometimes determine what the course of action is, but typically they give the seller the opportunity to make it right. I've had people bring their machines to me that where it wasn't destroyed, but like the motor casing had chipped or broken off or what have you. I've given an estimate to the customer for repair costs and parts. And then many times the seller will reimburse the customer that much. If the machine is completely destroyed and unusable or beyond repair, typically eBay is going to force the seller to reimburse you that full amount. And you're probably going to end up keeping the machine because there's no way that that seller is going to eat that money and pay for you to ship the dam damaged machine back. So I've seen it happen a couple different ways. Um, and again, on our handout, there's going to be a ton of things um, in there. Uh, there's a, two pages about shipping. I'm not going to do a uh, complete coverage in there. We are working on a free workshop that you can click on that's actually going to teach you how to package machines. But more importantly, you'll be able to send this information to a seller so that you can cover your bases and try to get that machine to you in one piece. All right, this is my one of my most favorite. And this is where my start came from, which was um, shopgoodwill.com. Um, if you've not had a chance to poke around on that website yet, I highly recommend it. Um, it's great, not just for sewing machines. I think this is genius. I know a lot of people don't like to give their money to Goodwill. When it comes to sewing machines, though, this is an excellent resource. So you can do a local search, um, just like eBay and Facebook. You can pick up in one of their hubs, whichever one they're selling from. Now, that's key. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but that's you can avoid shipping. Um, this is not going to be like your Goodwill store up the street. What's happening is, I don't know if you've tried, like if you've seen people go and donate their sewing machines to Goodwill. Um, Goodwill is to the point where most of them won't even accept them anymore because they're a pain to deal with. No one on staff knows how to deal with them. They price them too high and then they sit there. So most Goodwill will say no. We don't take them. What they're doing instead, the ones that end up coming in, they're shipping them to these hubs. And then there's this, the hub has this entire marketing department that puts all these things up for auction because now they know that they're getting higher dollar from the auction than they are just sitting in a, a thrift store. Um, I've seen this with the really good rare featherweights. And if you be, become an expert level on accessories with machines, um, I've seen a, a standard featherweight, like a black one that would normally go for about 400 or 450 to $500 go for almost $10,000 because someone, because people spotted the little penguin walking foot, which is worth far more than the machine is. So we, there are eagle eye people out there that watch for these things and catch them and Goodwill capitalizes on that. So um, here's what the website looks like when you first click on it. And again, I just put in um, sewing machines. I think I just did general sewing machine. And what I really want you to look at down here is the seller location. Um, I don't think that I would personally risk having a machine shipped from Goodwill unless it was something that was like really high on your wish list. Um, it's gotten better. I will say my experience is what I see online. The shipping has gotten better. They're more knowledgeable. They run by the same rules. If they ship it to you and it's damaged, they're going to have to make it right. So there's a lot more awareness on shipping sewing machines. So down here at the bottom under seller location, I put in Atlanta, Georgia, and I hit apply. And now it brings up this entire list of machines that's going to be available near me, 
What I have learned though, that doesn't mean it's going to be in Atlanta, Georgia. It's just in the hubs that are around my area. I don't think Atlanta even has one. My closest one for years was Nashville. So um, when you get, I'm going to click on this one here. This is um, a free brand sewing machine. And I also want to, for those of you that are in the vintage machine um, workshop, this is especially important for you. And for those of you looking to get into repairing, restoring, um, reselling, these machines, a lot of times are going to say for parts or repair. Remember what I said about people not knowing a lot about sewing machines? If the thing doesn't work immediately, if it shows any sign of rust, if there's a missing part, it's automatically labeled as for parts only or repair. That means cheap. And if you're in the vintage machine workshop and you get these skills under your belt, you can look at this machine and tell, well, all the parts are there and there's some rust, but you know that machine's going to outlive all of us. So you're going to know how to clean it, lubricate it, and make it move again. And right now, this machine's at $20. Um, you could... And if there was only six hours left, I guarantee you that machine went for $20. <laughs> so um, because your average person doesn't know how to um, clean it up and make it new again. And it's assumed that it's going to be a terrible machine. So keep that in mind when you're looking at these auctions. Um, so I'm scrolling down to the bottom of the page. And again, so when you see that parts or repair, I try to look at the description down here. This one didn't really give anything. My guess is that it's parts or repair because it does have rust on it. And it's assumed that because there's rust, it means it's not going to work. Or I don't think it's, mo I can't tell if there's a motor with it. If there was, it may not have turned on immediately. They just dis assume it's going to be broken. Um, I do find it laughable that they put it suitable for embroidery. Uh, technically, if you're going to do it manually, it is, but it's really not made for um, embroidery. Uh, one more thing I want to show you, like I said, pay attention to the location because this was under the Atlanta, Georgia, and it's technically Gastonia, North Carolina, which is maybe about a three to four hour drive. Would I drive that far for this $20 machine? No, but I'll tell you what I did when I first got my start learning to um, restore these machines. We have a hub up in Nashville. And my family is in St. Louis. So for two weeks before we'd plan a trip, I would be on Goodwill. And this was back before I was on everyone's radar. This is 12 years ago. I was finding machines for $4, $3, $2, $7. And I would take um, those two weeks and I would purchase these through auction. And Goodwill will hold them for two weeks for you. And you can go pick them up in person. So what we would do is... The time leading up to it, I'd make all these purchases and on our way back from St. Louis, we'd stop in Nashville and pick up like eight or nine sewing machines and bring them home. And my collections, you know, I'd bring home eight or nine machines for less than $40. So I think prices were probably not quite that cheap anymore. But if you can do the same thing, watch the hubs. And um, if you're looking to start you know, getting this experience, then purchase these machines for cheap, go pick them up all at one time and look at all the hubs in your area. But just make sure you're paying attention to where your um, your location is. They're going to send you an email and I think it will give you a deadline on when you have to pick up. So as long as you keep on top of your obligations, then you could hit a gold line of sewing machines. So again, I love, I love Goodwill auction. So the listing is going to show you how long is left in the auction. Again, this works the same way as eBay. You're going to want to put in your, your bid limit. I think it's by $1, but you're still going to only want to bid on those items in the last several minutes uh, because you're just driving the price up and someone's going to see it. They're going to keep outbidding you. So it's those last literally 60 seconds is what really matters. And as far as shipping, um, they will ship to you. Uh, like I said, it's gotten better over time, but there is no guarantee because each location handles their own shipping and it probably depends on who's packing that day. So um, I do know that I have several customers that have learned this and they do have um, notes that they send to Goodwill when they purchase and I feel like it has helped. So if it does arrive damaged, Goodwill is going to work with you with photos and make it right. All right, so for my other local sales, yard sales are my personal favorite. Um, I haven't really done this. I don't think most of us have since COVID. Um, I don't know what the state of uh, yard sales looks like right now, but I like it because um, it's really my number one source for 
your cast iron singers and your Kenmore machines. I find more of those for like $15 than I do in any other source. Um, like I said here, these people are ready to get these machines out of the house. At the time that a yard sale finally happens and someone's willing to part with grandma's old Kenmore means they're ready for it to go. So it may sit there for a while and you may be able to make a really good deal for someone that's just happy to get it to go away. As a bonus, you also get really good stories with the sewing machine. So um, if I'm really big on the stories and the ephemera that come with it, because I did not grow up in a sewing family. So I think it's interesting when you inherit someone else's history um, with it. <laughs> uh, and also check yard, sa uh, yard sale sites. If you're on Facebook, your local area or the next town over probably has a yard sale site. I see sewing machines in those groups all the time. It's going to follow the same thing as Facebook Marketplace. The majority of people are going to have no idea about the machine. They're not going to be able to answer any questions for you. They won't even be able to tell you how much it's worth. So that's just some waters you're going to have to navigate. Estate sales are fantastic, especially for your higher end or your rare good machines. Um, like featherweights. I see a lot of featherweights and treadles, especially in estate sales. Um, it can be time consuming, but you're going to, usually those auction houses will post pictures. And if you get really good at spotting covers and cases and uh, the design of what's, what holds a sewing machine, you can usually get a pretty good clue of what's in there. Um, the price usually decreases with each day of the sale. So if you have a three day estate sale, the percentage usually drops. And I've seen people get really good treadle machines um, for 50 to 75% off on that last day because they want it out of there. Um, the number one reason is again, and this is, I'm telling you, this is important for those of you that are looking to restore and resell and create a business for yourself. It's because no one understands sewing machines. Um, you're buying it kind of blindly. The salesperson can't tell you anything about it. They just know that it's an old machine. So they want to get it the heck out of there. That's what makes the estate sales worth it. Um, let's see, we got thrift stores. So outside of Goodwill, I'm still finding that your independent thrift stores will try to uh, take in sewing machines and resell them. Um, same issue, they're not gonna know anything about it. So if if there's not someone in the store that knows how to thread a machine and make it so, it's probably gonna be passed off as not working correctly. Um, they uh, Goodwill stores in my area will not accept anything to do with a sewing machine anymore. But what I have learned, whether it's Goodwill or any independent thrift shop, if you go in there and build a relationship with the manager, a lot of times they will call you because, you know, their employee is going to take in a carload of stuff and there's going to be a sewing machine in there. And the guy's going to be like, oh, another one, really? And if you build a relationship with that person, they will call you and say, please come get this thing. Sometimes for free, sometimes they want a few dollars, but relationships are everything. Um, I have acquired a number of machines that we have serviced and passed on to a family in need from the thrift stores. So again, um, you're, you may go in there and find a treadle for $400 knowing it's never gonna sell and they may not bend. And this is one of my most favorite, um, which I teach in our vintage machine workshop, which is ask your friends and family. I'm not kidding. I, I When I first started this, I needed machines to learn on. And I was like, nobody I know is going to have a sewing machine. I was so wrong. Um, I did post on Facebook once that if anybody has any old sewing machines there that aren't working or they want to get rid of, I'd be willing to take them. And I'm telling you, within six months, those machines were multiplying on my doorstep. I would have friends that would say, hey, I'm driving by your house and I'm dropping off a sewing machine that my neighbor gave me. And we would come home and there would literally be um, sewing machines. Now there's probably still 300 of those in my storage unit that we're working on, but you will get sewing machines. Um, one person in my workshop is actually posted on, I want to say probably marketplace or Craigslist and asking for the same thing. We like to not things not to go to the dump. So, um, you may get a mix of new and old, but I guarantee you there are people with sewing machines that don't sew that don't even want it anymore. Um, so they're in attics and basements and closets. So post and see what happens. Um, it doesn't really cost you anything. Um, antique stores, I'm kind of torn on more often than not. If you find a machine in a, a antique store, it's going to be overpriced. Again, the people selling them, they're used to the antique world, but there's no book that tells anyone the value. There's no guiding system. So mo more often than not, they're wanting to cover the cost of their booth and the percentage that goes to the, to the um, antique mall. Um, 
What I learned, though, is that if you're not used to antiquing, you can go to the front desk and ask them to contact the seller to make an offer. I've learned if I'm going to buy a sewing machine from an antique store, 90% of the time I'm not going to pay their asking price. Occasionally, I've ran across one that they've marked down enough, and I don't like to be unfair. If it's worth it or a little above, I'll go ahead and pay it. Um, I don't like to rip people off, but I'm not going to pay crazy prices. So you can go up and ask them to um, make an offer. And also what I did not know is if you go up and ask this, sometimes the seller has already authorized the antique mall to give a small discount, which is usually like 10%. So sometimes that 10% will tip the edge for me on purchasing. But like I said, if it's a machine I really want, you can make an offer. They'll call and try to contact the seller and the seller will be like, sure, I'll take that, especially if it's been sitting in their booth for some time. Um, and also I have learned um, that if there's a couple machines or things in the booth that you want, they may be willing to um, bargain with you a little bit. So if there's two or three machines that you really want, they may come down and just offer, you know, a package price for the three of them. I did that once in Marietta, Georgia or Kennesaw, I think um, it was a Wheeler and Wilson a so handy, which is the precursor to the featherweight and one other machine. <clears throat> and I almost took a fourth, but I stuck with the three. And I think I ended up paying, they were all together with about $800. And I think I ended up paying about four for, um, for all three of them, but they were very rare machines for my collection. So it never hurts to ask. I'm going to tell you that over and over again, asking is the key to getting the machines. Um, and again, most machines are going to be tagged with rare, even when they aren't. You'll see tons of Singer 66s marked rare. <laughs> so uh, don't don't believe the rare. All right. So from miscellaneous possibilities, Free Cycle is still around. It is an app where people are just trying to get rid of um, junk that's in their home that you it's free for you to come pick up. Right now, you're going to see a lot of... Uh, well, in two months, you're going to see a lot of treadmills and ellipticals and things like that. But I do find a lot of um, sewing machines on there, um, probably a lot of, of the lower end ones, but you never know what you're going to get. The Let's Go app, which is kind of like a yard sale app. Um, again, I mentioned online yard sale groups. Look on Facebook, do a Google search for your area or your city or whatever's close to you, and you're probably going to find a yard sale site. Recycling centers. I even have someone in my workshop that acquired his first um, sewing machine from a recycling center. A lot of times people um, take these things in for recycling and the recycling centers, if it's a whole machine, will actually set it on a shelf with a whole bunch of other junk that it's not really worth tearing down. And you can sometimes getting for cheap, cheap or free. Um, and Craigslist. I have not looked at Craigslist in probably three or four years. People still sell stuff on there, but it's so loaded with scams and it's such a big risk. I don't think it's worth it, not even just for safety, but the whole thing operates off your phone number. And, you know, we're all a little bit weary about how our stuff is used as marketing anyway. And when I... I got to the point when I was posting machines for sale on there, it was scams all day long. So to me, Craigslist is really not worth it. Um, but if you use Craigslist, there are definitely sewing machines on there. I know this is kind of odd. I do make a list of search terms um, because sometimes it doesn't occur to you. Obviously, sewing machine. This one makes people laugh, but I'm telling you, I have some of my best finds have been looking for sewing machine, not sewing machine. Um, also with treadle, T-R-E-A-D-L-E -E, is often spelled T-R-E-D-D-L-E. -E. So play around with the spelling um, of your, your search terms, uh, antique machines, vintage machines, old machines, and then you can start searching for brands. If you're looking for a Singer 66 or a, uh, a new home or whatever, search by models and brands. All right, so that covers how to acquire machines. Again, in the guidebook, there is a whole lot. There's some notes in here. I will keep adding to it. And whenever I add to it, the, the supplements will be in the everything sewing group. All right, so for let's talk about machines to avoid. Now, again, this is kind of a sticky subject. This is one person's opinion and it's mine. You can go in all of the Facebook groups and ask questions and you're going to get a million different answers. But this is based on what I see in my shop and have every day for a decade. Um, my, my machines to avoid is very short and sadly, they are pretty much all singer. So the, my reason for my list is they are based on known issues that are widespread. This is not one or two machines that have issues. This is pretty much every single one of these machines. Um, the investment is not worth the cost. 
And in fact, when someone gives it to you for free, more often than not, it's going to be a burden than it is a gift. So keep this in mind. Um, for those of you that are learning to repair and resell, these do not have resale value, even when they are repaired and working properly. Um, it's it's just they have such a reputation um, of being difficult or expensive that just people don't want them. So these were mass produced machines. Um, again, I said they were Singer. This is when the late 60s and early 70s when Singer was going through a financial distress and they moved their metal gears from from being sturdy cast iron steel to plastic nylon. All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that more in a minute. We're going to start with the touch and sew, which is also known as the touch and throw or the cuss and sew <laughs> or cuss and throw. Um, and that's because they are finicky machines. So they were very, very popular when they first came out. And what made them revolutionary is you actually wind your bobbin in the machine. I think that that is a fantastic feature. And I'm really sorry that Singer never had a chance to uh, evolve that uh, technology and make it better. So it's kind of a blessing and a curse because that means there's extra mechanisms now that can break or whatever. You if so if your bobbin winder mechanism is not working properly, you can't. There's no way that you there's you can't wind a bobbin. You can't put it on an external um, bobbin winder. You can't put it on another machine. It's broke. Um, so that's part of the feature issue. Um, so even when they're working properly, honestly, they're kind of a pain. We also have the Singer Futura, which was the next generation um, that still winds in the in the machine, but the features were kind of upgrading a little bit at this time. We have the Singer Athena, which we're starting to move into the first look at electronics with um, with machines, and then we have the Touchtronic. And there's various models of all four of those, um, <laughs> hundreds, but I just wanted to give you an idea what they look like. This is all in the handout too. All right, so the reason, oh, and Singer Merit, there's millions of these things. Um, these work until they don't, so they have similar issues. You can see four different styles here, and this picture is uh, the thing to look for. If you look at the features on them, they all share two things in common. One, the telltale knob on the side with the push button reverse, and then the two, um, the sliding knobs up the top. So you're going to see many, many, many variations of these. I'm not saying they're terrible machines. I'm saying that they're not worth the investment. Um, if someone gives them to you for free, you might have some hope, but they are, uh, they were considered entry level machines. Okay. So why not these machines? Again, I mentioned plastic nylon gears. They are deteriorating at a quick pace and have to be replaced. So when Singer was going through that period and started switching over to plastic nylon, our lubricants were much different that many years ago than they are now. What they did not know is that many of the lubricants that they used at that time actually break down plastic and nylon. So it's not a matter of if these gears are going to fail, it's when. So replacement on gears is possible. I mean, I can get gears for pretty much any machine, but they are not, <laughs> they are not easy. That's one of two things we do that we all kind of dread in the shop because you could lose an entire day or you can lose three days to one machine and no machine is the same as the next. Um, some of those Athenas and Touchtronics get into electronics that are very, very rudimentary and can be repaired, but it's very costly. Um, to give you an idea on gears, if one of those touch and sews comes in and we have to replace the gears, you're looking at about $400. And we are one of the few shops left that will actually replace the gears. There's really not a lot left out there. Um, most of them are just going to tell you it's not worth it to fix. So we are very upfront with our customers. And when they ask us, should I do it? Well, if it's a sentimental machine and that's really what you're tied to, I get a lot of older ladies that say, I've used this machine my whole life. This is the only machine I want. Then it's worth it. Um, if it's a machine you picked up, uh, at the thrift store for 10 bucks, cut your losses. So it's not a cheap, uh, or easy endeavor, honestly. <laughs> um, and again, the resale value is almost nothing. We get machines that once we've repaired them, they've been abandoned in our shop. We can't sell them to save our life because they have such a reputation, unfortunately. So, um, again, and part of my transparency, I know it gets tiring when you go into a repair shop and they kind of give you a very vague answer. I'm very big on transparency. So I want you to see what we're looking at. These are actual pictures from customers' machines. Um, this is uh, on the upper vertical gear on a touch and sew. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit and you can actually see where the crack in the, uh, the gear is. 
The, the horizontal gear, the white one there, typically doesn't fail as often, but the black ones do. And then also the worm gear is a very big one. So what I have circled there, there should actually be a gear there that looks like this, and it just completely deteriorated. And that's where that should be. So again, we have to do a large amount of disassembly inside the machine um, to get this together. It is such a complex process. I do not teach this in our vintage machine class. There will be a separate workshop, probably not till 2024, if I had to guess. We will teach replacing gears, but it's a long way down the road. The replacement of the gears is not the worst part. It's all of the micro settings that have to happen with timing and adjustments after the machine's put back together that really can hang you up. So those are my absolutely avoid. There were, I will add more machines to this list um, with time. Again, the supplements will be in the everything sewing um, group as they develop. So I have a list now of machines with known hard to find parts. So why not these machines? I'm not saying don't purchase these machines. Like as touch and sew, I'm saying just leave it. Um, with this list specifically, these are machines that come in that even need a belt, just a motor belt, which is a very standard replacement part on a machine. Um, we check springs a little when you're um, you're threading through the tension assembly and there's that little spring there. Sometimes finding that spring is impossible. The entire machine could be pristine. Without that spring, it's useless. So it's a lot of it has to do with just being able to get parts. So the thing about these machines though, is that if it's a working machine, you could have another 20 years with it. So it is a gamble, but just know that they do have known issues. And again, most of these were considered low end machines or entry level, and they were meant to be disposable, which means that that's why parts are not available anymore. And this does apply only to the newer within the last 40 years maybe of machines. For example, we have the white sewing machines, Finding belts and uh, springs for these machines are almost impossible. Also, they do have a lot of plastic parts on the inside. Once those gears go or any of the, um, the cam stack or anything, it's done. There's no repair option. However, White also made cast iron machines. So usually the metal machines are a different um, animal. They I can still usually get parts for those. So that doesn't mean that all White sewing machines are a loss. For Ricar, Ricar is almost impossible to find anything for. I can find bobbins, I but that's that's it. No guides, no no parts that are broken off. Um, I probably have six or seven uh, machines in our queue that we've been looking for motor belt for over two years. COVID made it worse, but there's just nothing out there. Nobody's producing parts for Ricar anymore. Same thing for Montgomery Ward. Um, sometimes I can make singer belts work on those, but for the most part, if your check spring is broken, your tension assembly, none of those things I'm going to get. Or JC Penney. Uh, I think that those were probably manufactured under another bigger umbrella. I don't really know the history, but their parts are impossible to find. So now I want to get into the good one. Again, this is not a comprehensive list of reliable machines, but for people that are looking to invest in a first machine to use, this is a great list. Um, it's also, if you're looking to learn to restore and resell, you can almost always turn these machines around and make a decent profit. So this is all in the guidebook. I do have visual um, pictures in the guidebook for you too. So I'm going to start with Bernina. These are in no particular order. And by no means the entire list of machines that I think Bernina makes great. But these are three of the most popular. Um, you have the Bernina 730, 830, and 930. Um, the 730, I see a lot of people buying those machines if they're doing heavier duty or stuff like canvas or, um, you know, a lot of people like to stretch the limits of these machines because they are workhorse machines does not mean they are industrial machines. So I find people asking about fixing the sail on their sailboat or the canvas on this or leather on this. You can get away with that for a short time, but you will destroy these machines. The 730, though, usually seems to be very popular for people who are making dog collars, um, things of that nature. The 830 is my personal favorite because it's very basic, very mechanical, and has a great selection of stitches, and it's so smooth. Uh, and then the Bernina 930 is actually, in my opinion, probably the most popular. If you have a 930 in great working condition um, with the case and some accessories, you can still easily get a, probably 1000 to 1500 for that machine if it's in good condition. So they do hold their, their resale value. 730s, on the other hand, you can probably pick one up for 150 to 200. And then the 830 is somewhere in the middle where you can probably find them for between 200 and 600. 
for Singer, Singer is a very long list. Most of you are probably familiar with these two, the 221 and the 301. The Featherweight was the first portable machine um, that Singer made to allow women to leave home to sew. Um, and that's where our uh, a lot of our sewing bees come from. We don't have to, you know, bring the, uh, the frame down from the ceiling anymore at the church. The 301 is the cousin to the Featherweight. Um, if you're not familiar uh, or you, you need it, we do have a free how to use your Featherweight 301 workshop on our website at sewingdocacademy.com. Absolutely no cost. Walks you all the way through using both of those machines. And we do have a paid workshop for full service of both of those machines uh, also on the website. The next two are the Singer 201 and 1591, two of the most requested machines in my shop. And that's because those two machines are considered the most sturdy or most powerful machines before you start breaching over into industrial. Again, that does not mean you can treat it like an industrial. You can sew denim with it, but I wouldn't recommend sewing 20 layers of denim with it. Um, fashion leather, but not belt leather. Um, they are gear driven, direct motor driven. There is no belts on either of those machines. And that's one reason that they are so appealing. Um, the one caveat to those is that they typically do need rewiring at the motor. Uh, in our shop, you're looking at about $180 total for the service and the rewiring. Um, the motor is very delicate. When you rewire it, there is a point of no return. If you clip that wire too short, your motor is dead. So that's one reason why it's so costly. But they are excellent machines. The Singer 66, you will find... I think there's four, maybe five different decal patterns. What you see there is a red eye. There's also the gingerbread, the Tiffany, the Sphinx. So there's several different decal patterns. Um, and a lot of them are regional. So you might find the gingerbread pattern more common in one area of the country. Down here in the South, we see tons of red eyes. Uh, and then there's also the standard black with regular um, gold decal on it. The Singer 99 is a three quarter head, which means it's about three quarters the size of um, your standard. Like if you put it next to a 66, it's only gonna be three quarters the size of that machine, but it is just as heavy. I don't know what the reason is, but I bought a 99 when I was first starting to quilt and I hauled it to a sew-in and I was like, this machine's heavier than the big one. So it's not any lighter, even though it's smaller. Um, three more uh, uh, singers that I love. The 338 is very popular right now, mainly because of its color, but it is an excellent machine, has built in zigzag and straight stitch. The Singer 400 and Singer 500 has been surging in popularity for the last probably four or five years. Um, in my opinion, if I'm talking to someone who wants a vintage machine that has built in zigzag and straight stitch and maybe the capability for other things, this is my favorite. That Singer 500 Rocketeer right there, um, so that's a 503, I believe, or 501, um, is my absolute favorite. It looks awesome. It's very, very cool looking, but it is sturdy. Um, I Once they are serviced and cleaned like they're supposed to, they need very little attention. The timing doesn't really get thrown on those. Um, more often than not, there's some things that get stuck if it's neglected, but it is an excellent machine. The same for the 400 series. And everybody has their preference. Um, do we have any Elna fans in the house? This is my personal favorite foreign brand. Um, I am done collecting machines for the most part, but this one right here, the Elna Grasshopper, is probably the one thing left on my wish list, um, mainly because it's unique and it's also green, um, but it sews beautifully. It's a very unique machine um, and it's controlled only by the knee, which is that little knee bar there. Uh, those are excellent and good collector's items. The Elna SU in the entire series is extremely popular for people who sew. It has built-in straight zigzag and a few other things and can also take cams, but it is such a quiet, smooth machine. Um, any version of the Elna SU series is definitely worth it. And then we also have the Elna Lotus, which if you've not seen one of these, I own one of these, it's wired for the UK, so I need to rewire it. But what you see there, the little... Um, it's kind of like the Swiss version of the featherweight. Those little ramps in the front and the side and the back actually fold up and it's very compact and very easy to carry, but it is sturdy. So even though it's compact, it doesn't mean it lacks any um, sturdiness. 
For necky machines, um, two of the more, there's not a whole lot. There's variations of these two out there. You have the necky BU, which is a, a great, great machine. It's really pretty to look at. And then we have um, the, the Lelia. There's also a Supernova. There's probably four other ones that are really good. But neckies are Italian made machines and they are fantastic. Um, the Viking 6000 series. This is the only machine I'm mentioning from Viking because it is by far their most popular in the vintage realm. But it, I do want to give you a little bit info about the problem with this machine. There's tons of them out there. And in this case, I'm going to tell you, yes, the repair is worth it. Um, first of all, if you turn around to the back of the machine where you put your cams in, this is very, very common right now. Um, that is the cam gear, which uh, it changes the, the stitch selection for you, um, you can see there's a big crack there. Now that's gonna cost you probably about $100 for the part and the labor is gonna be depending on the shop. So you're probably by itself, if that's your only issue, you're probably looking at about 225 or 250 in most shops if I had to guess. That's what you would be paying in my shop. Um, I do have a specialist on staff that handles Viking specifically. Um, so that's one issue, but there's usually a second issue that might have caused that issue. And this is the, um, the, the stitch selector, button holder, and the cam stack, right? Let me blow that up for you. So this is what the inside of these machines look like. That is factory lubricant. And while it looks soft and gummy, it is hard as a rock. And so whenever a machine sits for a while and people go and mess with the knobs, a lot of times people force it and things break. So if first of all, if you acquire one of these, don't go forcing anything to move. The second thing I see a lot, which rips my heart out, is in the Facebook groups. When this shows up and people say, you know, my knobs aren't moving properly, I can't change the stitch length, everyone's going to tell you, get a hairdryer and heat it up and then let it go. Do you see the issue with this? First of all, there's a lot of plastic parts in there, not on the mechanisms, but inside the machine. The problem is, is you're not going to be able to melt most of that out of there. It's varnished. When I'm telling you varnished, like you can't even scrape it off. So what you can melt is going to run down, melt into other parts of the machine and harden right back up again. So occasionally I see people have temporary success with that, but you really run the risk of killing this machine. So to give you an idea what has to happen, again, this is what my specialist does all the time. That entire mechanism has to come out and be fully disassembled and use a very specific solvent to get all of that off of there. And then eventually, this is the exact same mechanism put back together so it works again. Uh, I, now, he's an engineer, uh, and i not an electrical engineer. He's a true engineer. He is a good example of someone who has surpassed the teacher because his brain works so well. He can do this in a couple days where it would take me a month because you do disassemble. Not only do you have to get it back together properly, when these components go back in the machine, he can spend two days getting everything timed right and put back together and working properly because Viking definitely over-engineered their machines. So it is definitely not for the faint of heart. Um, if you're curious, in our shop, it's going to run you about 450 for everything. That's replacing the gear that was broken um, and disassembly, cleaning it out and everything, which I'll be honest with you, I've watched him do this work. $450 is a bargain. And these machines do have hold their value and people love them. So in my opinion, that repair is worth it. If you do acquire one of these and you do have to have one repaired, you be very selective about where you take it. Taking it to a Viking dealer is useless in most cases. If you have someone on staff there that is very specifically aware of the issue and knows how to address it, I would be surprised, but it does happen. It's usually an independent shop. Um, I think in the group, um, one of the vintage machine groups, maybe the Viking one, there is a gentleman out of Colorado. He's a retired veteran that does do this for, uh, he doesn't really charge a whole lot for it, but he does charge. You can ship your machine to him. Our technician is working on a program where we can have people send them in because we're getting tons of requests, but make sure that someone is specifically aware of this issue. Um, it is in the handout because if they say, oh yeah, we can just clean it out and they don't know, they don't know. All right. So that covers the Viking one. Kenmore's, I can spend 20 pages on Kenmore machines. There's only a handful that I think are problem, but there are only problems when they're mistreated. You really can't go wrong with most Kenmore's. Um, a lot, if you do your research on Kenmore's, you will find some that hold their value greatly too. 
for five machines, I have the 260, 1222, and the 130. By far, the 1222 is the most popular. Um, the switch has a tendency to go bad on it, that little red button in the front. And what happens is when that switch goes bad, you're not getting power to the machine and everybody assumes the motor is dead or it's completely broken. And that's a $5 fix on that switch. So a lot of times customers will bring in their broken machine and a parts machine they bought off eBay so that we could have parts to use for it. And they end up leaving with two working machines, which makes me very happy. And I briefly want to mention um, some other great machines. I could spend days talking to you about my favorite machines but this is going to narrow it down a little bit. We have the Morris brand, which if you're into those really cool looking, um, you know, car-like designs, Morris is good for that. Brother um, also has also Japanese made brothers. These colorful ones are typically ones that were manufactured in Japan. Don't let that scare you. Um, back in that day, I do think that Japan probably had a bit of an edge over the U.S. as far, as far as their quality. They're, they're kind of in line. Um, but Japan was smart enough to make them a little bit prettier sometimes. Uh, the new home brand, which is now Junomi, makes excellent machines. And then we have, an there's tons and tons of just various Japanese made. You'll see the name Atlas, Vasetti, Dressmaker, uh, Bond, anything that has a label on it that you don't recognize as a brand name. If you look at the serial number, it's probably going to start with JA, but it's probably a Japanese made sewing machine. Um, and and from personal standpoint, the Japanese made are probably my absolute favorite because they are so stunning to look at and their features are really intriguing. So, uh, so yeah, there's tons of things to look at for that. All right. I have, if you want the free handout, which is our guidebook, we're going to keep adding to it over the next four weeks and then supplements after that. If you would do me a favor, leave a comment, just say, I want the handout. Um, it's going to take me a little time to get them sent out. I'm not asking for an email address. This is all free. I'm not trying to get anything from you. I just want to give you the info. Um, on Facebook, leave the comment and I'm going to send it to you through the messenger. Um, you're going to have to check probably a different tab if we've never communicated before. I'm not sure how that works in the back end. You don't see it right away. Look for someone, you a message or whatever it says. If you're look, If you're watching on YouTube, if you can head over to Facebook and post on there or send me an email at info at Sewing Doc Academy. I am not capturing your email addresses for this. I will not send you anything unless you opt into something. So I, again, I'm not trying to collect your info. If you have any questions about anything I covered here, if you will leave your questions in the comment section, I will go back through um, today and tomorrow, the next few days and answer your questions. If you're watching the replay, ask for the handout, ask questions, and I'm happy to help you. You can also email me at info at sewing.academy.com. And I want to give you a little preview of what's coming up. So next week, which is the 12th, we'll be back here at 1 p.m. Uh, we're going to talk about what might be the best machine for you based on features and capabilities, the pros and cons of specific machine types, accessories. We're going to talk about determining the price for buying and selling. And yes, there's going to be more handout. And I think I'm going to add to this also. Um, what did I, uh, I was going to add something to it. Oh, identifying machine models. So in your guidebook, you're going to find um, where the examples that I had given you, uh, like in this thing. But I do want to teach you to how to better identify different models and machines based on really, really crappy pictures you might see on the internet. So I'm going to add that to next week. The week after that, on the 26th, we're going to talk about, I like this machine, now what? So if you've been looking at these websites and you think you might be interested in a machine, we're going to talk about what you need to do when you go to look at the machine. If you stumble across one in an antique store or a thrift store, what can you do to try and determine if it's worth a purchase? We're going to go through all of that. Red flags about missing parts, what can be replaced, what damage you need to worry about. And um, do you need to have a service? We'll talk about how important it is after you acquire it. Do you need to take it in? What can you do yourself? And yes, of course, there will be a handout. Week four of this month, we're actually going to do a webinar. Um, this is going to talk more about the Vintage Machine Workshop in detail that you've heard me talk about. Um, you're going to see the inside of our on-demand library, the live classroom. We're going to do a free lesson on cleaning the exterior of your machine safely. And enrollment's going to open for that workshop again for and bonuses and all that stuff if you're interested. So 
that's pretty much um, what's coming up. I'm not really sure yet what we are looking at for next month. If anybody has any topics that you are um, interested in, it doesn't have to be vintage. Let me know. So I can kind of work that in. I just want to make sure we are keeping our information out there for anybody who wants it. So thank you all for spending the afternoon with me. I hope you all have a happy new year and it's off to a good start. Um, I am very excited for what we're doing this year. We're working on more social things. We've all been cooped up a little too long. Um, most of you that know me here, I work in solitude in the ambulance here. So anytime I can get on and socialize with y'all is great. And I happy to find that there's so many other vintage machine weirdos out there like me that probably border on obsessed. So I appreciate you and thank you for joining me.